WCNY, in partnership with Contact Community Services, welcomes you to the Let's Talk About It, Hope, Help, and Healing panel discussion, presented by Excellus and Northland Communications. Work anywhere with Business Unlimited. Our mobile app provides video conferencing, phone, chat, and webinar capabilities, all with 24-7 local support. Northland Communications, connecting Central New York since 1905. Welcome and thank you for joining us. I'm Tim Fox from News Channel 9, and I will be leading a conversation this morning, an important conversation for our community about hope, help, and healing. We're here today because September is National Suicide Prevention Month. It's a time to remember those affected by suicide, to raise awareness, and to focus efforts on directing treatment to those who need it the most. Suicide affects all of us, no matter what our background is, our age, gender, or race. No one is immune to having suicidal thoughts. In any given two-week period, one in 20 people have thoughts of suicide. That's one in 20 people right here among us today. Suicide has impacted countless lives here in central New York and all across the country. More than 45,000 Americans died by suicide in 2020, and suicide is the 12th leading cause of death in the United States today. We work tirelessly to try to reduce the stigma associated with mental health and suicide and to ensure those who are struggling the most are able to receive the help they need. But we've got to do more. So let's talk about it. I'd like to invite Jennifer Parmalee, the Deputy Commissioner of Direct and Director of Community Services of the Onondaga County Department of Children and Family Services to share a few opening remarks. Jennifer. Thank you, Tim. I am pleased to hear from this illustrious panel of dedicated individuals whose hearts and talent make a difference in the lives of our neighbors and our community. As September is National Suicide Prevention Month, I can think of no better discussion than that of supporting those facing a mental health or substance use crisis. Like a physical crisis, a mental health or substance use crisis can be devastating for those individuals and their families and our community. While an individual crisis cannot be fully predicted, we can plan how we structure services and organize approaches to best meet the needs of those struggling in a timely and highly effective manner. We know that an effective crisis system can save lives and improve the quality of life for those struggling. Onondaga County Departments of Children and Family Services and Emergency Communications, which is where our 911 center sits, are partnering with the City of Syracuse, law enforcement agencies, mental health and substance use providers, Contact Community Services, Onondaga County's 988 Crisis Call Center, and community members to develop a crisis system that meets our community's needs. We are coming together as a coordinated network to ensure that crisis situations can end in a positive outcome for the person struggling, their families, and our first responders. The core elements of a central New York crisis system of care are a regional crisis call center, which is contact 988 crisis uh, call lines, our mobile crisis response team, teams in which Onondaga County has three. We have Liberty, Liberty Mobile Crisis, St. Joe's CPEP mobile team, and the Helio Cody team, and crisis receiving and stabilization facilities. This includes our hospitals of Upstate Medical University, Hutchings, St. Joe's Comprehensive Psychiatric Emerg Emergency Program. And Helio has recently been awarded a grant from the New York State Office of Mental Health to open a crisis stabilization center right here in Onondaga County. We also have three overnight respite centers, Liberty Nova House, Access CNY Burkana House, and the Hutchings Children's Crisis Respite. Our network's goal is to implement a true no wrong door crisis system that is coordinated and highly effective. This network together has established a, a, a group of stakeholders that meet regularly to establish the Central New York Crisis System of Care. It's created a consistent framework for mobile crisis and police partnerships across the county. It has established the Central New York Crisis Network, uh, Network Group to ensure consistent and high quality mobile crisis response. 
It supports and participates in the police intensive crisis intervention training and has revamped and created a more efficient and effective admission to hospitalization process. Thank you to Contact, WCNY, and Tim for organizing this essential conversation, and I look forward to hearing the panel talk about their role in our Central New York crisis system of care. Jennifer Parmalee, thank you very much. It is time now to meet our panelists for this discussion. We will start with Don, Dawn Ayers, a registered nurse at St. Joseph's Health. Martin Brown is System of Care Manager at Access. Emily Darren Becker is the survivor of a loss uh, to suicide, a sister and advocate. Miriam Al Hindi is the 911 Diversion Coordinator for Contact Community Services. Stephanie Grandjean is the Assistant Director of Crisis Services for Contact Community Services. Tanya Lyons is the Program Director and for Regional Mobile Crisis Onondaga and Oswego for Liberty Resources. Lisa Mancini is the Vice President and Chief Clinical Officer at Helio Health. And Benjamin Rinaldi II is Deputy Commissioner Operations for Onondaga County Department of Emergency Com uh, Communications. Panel, thanks for being with us this morning. Uh, let's start the Q&A with Stephanie. What can somebody expect when they call uh, for uh, crisis services, whether it's for themselves, for a friend, for a family member, what can they expect? Yeah, so um, as Jen mentioned, contact responds to multiple crisis lines in our community, including the new 988 number, um, the contact hotline and Crisis Connect, which is our central triage line for um, central New York, and a various, various other lines as well. So we really believe that no matter what line someone calls in, we want to have a no wrong door approach. So when someone calls us, we always start with a greeting and a name exchange, build a connection right away through giving our name, taking a name. And then our goal is really to make the, the call a comfortable space for people to share whatever they're dealing with. Um, crisis can look like so many different things for each individual person. And so our counselors will have an open invitation to talk. They'll ask questions, um, they may reflect, but really our goal is to listen. Um, and as we're listening to that story, we get a sense of the level of crisis a person is in. Um, we ask questions about suicidal ideation, if anyone's made plans or you know, get, getting a timeline if they are having thoughts of suicide. And then we, we go from there. So if someone is just needing a space to talk, we provide that um, through active listening. If we feel like they could really use some additional community supports, we'll make um, warm connections to respite services, um, to mobile crisis services, to um, Helios Cody team. So all of our partners here we have really strong relationships with and we can make those connections. Um, if someone is calling concerned about a, uh, another person, someone they know, someone they love, we talk to them about how can you support this person? Are you comfortable having a conversation? What resources are there for you um, to support you through this difficult time and that person in need? And then we also can do something called a third party call wh where we will reach out on behalf of um, the person who's concerned. And again, link up to our partners in the community. So we have a really great system where we can de-escalate a lot of calls over the phone and when we need additional support reach out to our community members. One of those important uh, community partners is Liberty Resources. Tanya Lyons is here. Talk a little bit about your piece of the puzzle. Yeah, so when our partners at Contact triage a call that rises to the level of um, this person in distress really needs somebody face-to-face -to, -face to help them de-escalate their current crisis, our team responds as soon as possible. So it's really um, meant to be a rapid response in person to help somebody who's either experiencing suicidal ideation, hom homicidal ideation, or other mental health crises and substance abuse crises. We aim to de-escalate them in the moment, help them create a safety plan, and our main goal is to avoid any unnecessary hospitalizations, ED visits, or even arrests. We partner with law enforcement to help them manage um, people who are in mental health crises as well. Let me ask you about that. Uh, partnering with law enforcement, and I'm, anybody can, can answer this, how do you build the relationship? Everything is relationships. How do you build the trust with law enforcement locally? It takes time. Um, it's a culture shift, really. But we build that trust by showing up. We just show up. We show up, we help them. Um, you know, law enforcement's specialty is 
emergencies that are not mental health related, criminal activity, things like that, our specialty is mental health and substance use. And so we rely on each other to play those separate pieces. And when we show up and we help them address issues that they're not experts in, the trust naturally starts to increase. Don, talk a little bit about uh, St. Joseph's Health and, and their part in the entire so uh, CPAP, it's a comprehensive psychiatric emergency uh, program. Uh, similar to a medical emergency room, it's open 24-7. Um, anybody can uh, walk through our doors. Uh, they, um, law enforcement, uh, oftentimes will bring patients in for evaluation, and we continue to work on that um, trust with them there. They've actually done a lot of work in um, increasing their awareness of mental health issues and crises, so they uh, will present and give us um, a history of where they found the person, um, what the uh, reason for bringing them to CPEP is. Uh, we, um, we take care of patients from um, insomnia. They walk in the door and uh, they um, come in on a voluntary basis um, requesting to get connected to services or um, requesting medication management um, referrals and uh, to the most acutely ill psychotic um, individual. Those with suicidal ideation, um, they uh, also um, can come from any uh, degree of whether that's uh, chronic um, suicidal ideation that they've battled with their entire lives um, to uh, an acute situation um, that is um, new to them and uh, they um, maybe have experienced some sort of trauma or loss or uh, um, but uh, they do not have to come in with suicidal ideation to um, be asked about it. We ask every individual that comes in the door. Uh, you um, heard um, the question about have you ever uh, had any ideas of um, or thoughts of suicide and uh, do you have a plan? Um, suicide uh, has been studied uh, for quite some time from lots of different organizations. There's the um, New York um, Suicide um, Zero Suicide Coalition uh, and um, CPOP tries to align with all of these evidence-based practices um, and uh, so that we implement the best um, practice. So the Columbia Zero Su um, Suicide Severity Rating is where those questions come from. So you're um, measuring, have you ever had suicidal ideation, regardless of where, um, what the reason is that you came in, because sometimes people will not come out, come through the door and say, hey, I'm here because I, I don't wanna live. Um, so, uh, and then the Stanley Brown um, tool is also uh, evidence-based where, um, Patients are uh, in the moment of crisis, sometimes can't put their thoughts together enough because they're so narrow focused uh, that we have them think about it outside of that crisis when they're feeling a little more stable and able to understand that um, you do have resources and let's write those resources down and then you have a tool to take with you. Um, whether you put it on your refrigerator or you have a friend hold it for you, uh, what is it that, um, that you experience internally that uh, makes you, uh, that you had before you got into a crisis situation um, so that you can uh, anticipate maybe becoming and in, be getting into a crisis situation. And then what kind of things can you deploy um, when you recognize that? So early recognition uh, and pulling in um, and cocooning the person with their resources. So you're not alone. Um, and here are who the here are the people that you need to reach out to at that time. Um, we also offer patients mobile crisis follow up. So uh, this is to allow them um, when they get into the, back into their lives, right? So they have this crisis. They come into CPEP. Okay, I've done what I needed to do. You leave the door, uh, and life happens, and so you have all of these distractions. And um, the idea of mobile crisis doing a follow-up visit to a CPEP discharge is to reorient that person, okay? Remember, we had this crisis, and you had this crisis, and here was our plan to follow up. Did you get your medication? Are you taking your medication? Did you uh, get in touch with an outpatient provider? Um, 
the mental health crisis continues to rise. So a lot of our outpatient practices are saturated and um, learning how to navigate that system can be difficult. So we're there to help them maybe even uh, dial the number and plug it into their phone and um, assist them with uh, that phone call. Some of our younger population don't talk on the phone very much, so teaching them how to uh, identify themselves and ask what they need um, is uh, that final approach, and sometimes we'll even do that a couple times. And really that line, the, the talk about, you know, have you had any feelings about harming yourself is something that healthcare workers across the spectrum are asking yes. all of us. Uh, Mm -hmm. To normalize it a little bit? Yes. Just so it's not so foreign if you happen to hear it when you're in a crisis. Yeah. Well, the individual that's feeling isolated and alone, um, they uh, sometimes will express that um, they don't believe that people want to hear that, that it's, it's a unique situation to them. Um, so they don't have that connection or that um, uh, they don't have the will to, to ask for help. Uh, so by screening everybody. We also do what's called lethal means reduction. Um, which uh, is a way people that have suicidal ideation will oftentimes ex uh, have the same thought process, whether that is um, to overdose, to uh, self-harm. Um, death by police has become a rising uh, uh, um, thought process for them. Um, if we are able to identify, say it's the, the patient that uh, is saying that their plan was to overdose, if we're able to do a reduction, the, the lethal means reduction is to add some time. So if you have your pill bottles at the bedside and you feel impulsive and you're in this dark place, you grab them, there's not a lot of time to process that. But if they're on the other side of the house, 500 feet away or whatever, each one of those steps allows you a moment and an opportunity to reconsider um, that action. Lisa Mancini, what happens when the Helio Health team uh, responds? We have a couple options. Um, as Jen mentioned, we have a CODI team um, that we call, uh, it's called Center, uh, Center of Treatment and uh Center of Treatment Innovation. And that program was born um, several years ago um, as kind of a response to the opioid epidemic. So it's a mobile team that can respond in the community to somebody having a substance use disorder crisis. Um, a person can call themselves, a family member can call, or oftentimes we actually respond to some of our local hospitals um, or other places of business where they have somebody who might be in need of services. Um, increasingly, we've been seeing people calling um, the CODI team for not only substance use disorder crises, but also mental health crises, um, including uh, thoughts or concerns for suicide. So um, the team will go out in the community, meet the individual where they're at, whether it be at home or um, another place in the community. It could even be at a, at a Dunkin' Donuts, um, wherever that person feels safe and comfortable that we can send somebody to meet them. Um, it is a peer-led team, so people who have been through um, substance use disorders or mental health um, and are um, in recovery themselves can respond and, and talk to that person and really provide that listening ear um, and understanding of where they're coming from. Um, and then that, that team really is, their, their goal is to meet with somebody, engage with them, um, and, and provide what services they need and what they want. That may be accessing treatment, it may be um, just having an, an ear to talk to um, and, and kind of keeping connected um, until they're ready for the next steps. Um, additionally, we operate an open access center here in Syracuse, which is open 24 hours a day. We have clinical staff um, and peers on staff 24-7. Um, folks can just walk into that program and, and speak to somebody on site there. And Dawn talked a little bit about some of those evidence-based practices, in, including the suicide screen, um, safety planning, and um, we are part of the Zero Suicide Initiative as well. So we have a universal protocol um, in place where everybody that walks on the door first day um, gets to ask the questions about uh, from the CSSRS that um, Dawn mentioned. We ask them if they've had any thoughts of suicide or harming themselves. Um, and if they do, you know, we have a protocol from there. Um, we may do a risk assessment, uh, certainly do some safety planning with them. And um, as Stephanie mentioned earlier, um, we all communicate and, and work together. So if they do need um, to be taken to CPAP or referred to CPAP, we'll reach out and make that um, connection as well. Want to ensure safety, make sure folks um, know that we're there to help them and take care of them and uh, want what's best for them. Martin Brown, tell us what Access is all about and, and what your role in the picture is. Sure. So Access is the children's SPOA for Onondaga County. So specifically, we work with youth 0 to 21. 
Um, we, in our, our role with the mobile crisis response and the, the suicide response, we do a lot of uh, coordination after the crisis. So we work with Liberty Resources, Mobile Crisis, CPEP, Contact, um, to try to really wrap around support and services for um, children zero to 21 um, and young adults in the community um, to really see about what they need for both aftercare, um, but also really take a deeper dive and to figure out you know what's going on in their what's going on in their lives to like that they're at this place and how can we help connect them to services so um, you know we really try to make sure we're you know looking at the family and the youth comprehensively to see how best we can connect them to supports and services and um, you know we do a lot of other outreach in the community we have a lot of connections to different things it may not be a traditional support it might be um, a clinical support, but it really could be anything to support that youth and family. You know, it's it's family-led, um, youth-driven. We want to make sure we're respectful of youth and families. Um, but really, there's no wrong reason to to for some family to connect to us at Access. Um, we don't want there to be a barrier. That's the biggest thing. And then my role specifically, I do a lot of collaboration with all the rest of the people on this panel um, to make sure we're not missing anything, to make sure we're not missing any gaps. You know. Um, you know, there's there's certainly stigma attached to mental health, and we want to make sure that like there's there's no reason that somebody is not reaching out, and, and kids are afraid, you know. So like there's always that stigma to that, and we want to make sure any way we can do to eliminate that and make it easy for them. So there's no wrong reason to to work with us at Access. That's what we usually say. Thanks, Ben Rinaldi. When does the 911 center come into play with people that are in crisis? Usually, excuse me, usually it'll be the initial phone call, which could be from a family member, the person in crisis themselves. Um, one of our partners, maybe contact would call us, uh, maybe Liberty, and we would get the initial call, and then we would try to determine the most appropriate resources to send to that person. With our partnership now, um, having contact with us at our center certain hours and during the week, sometimes we can have them take over a call where uh, traditionally you would send the police and they may not be the best resource. So we work with contact and they will determine maybe a mobile crisis response is needed, maybe a mobile crisis and a police response is needed, or maybe they can just talk to the person and determine what they need as far as other services that can be provided. Mary Malhindi, you've been working on that co-location project. Talk a little bit about what's going on, what's happened so far, and, and how it helps. Yeah, so we've got um, a team of us crisis line workers who work at Contacts who are already answering like the 988 and Contact Hotline Crisis Connect over there. So there's a team of us on some days that we now work shifts at the 911 center. So any call that someone is calling 911, they may be in crisis, someone else may be in crisis, um, if it's mental health related and there isn't an immediate, you know, like harm to self or others happening and it may be determined that, like Ben mentioned, maybe they just need to speak to someone over the phone or have more of that mental health support there in person, the call will then be sent to us and, you know, we'll have the opportunity to speak with them. It opens up the lines, um, you know, opens up the 911 lines for other emergencies to come in so we can speak to the individual a little bit longer and then from there potentially send out mobile crisis instead of sending out the police or sending out an EMS. Like Tanya mentioned, sometimes hospitalizations aren't necessarily needed. And so how can we prevent that by, you know, talking over the phone, de-escalating that way or sending out a mental health team instead? Are you already seeing the benefits? I am. It's a lot that we're learning. It's a lot that between us and the call takers um, through 911 and like the dispatchers and law enforcement, it's definitely a, a learning curve. It's new things. You know, there was, there's a certain way that a response happened. So we're all working together to figure out, you know, maybe in this scenario, how can we implement a different way of response? How can we include a, you know, crisis line worker? How can we include mobile crisis? So I do see, um, positive impact so far and improvement for sure to come in the future too. Ben, you were a dispatcher at the beginning of a long career. Um, talk a little bit about your thoughts about this co-location and, and being able to work together. I think, excuse me, I think it's very good because 
in the past, it would just be an automatic police or EMS response. And sometimes if you send the police, it may not de-escalate the situation, it may make it worse. And we found out over the years that when you get the proper resources and mental health providers involved, that sometimes they can go and respond by themselves and handle the situation and not involve the police and come to a success, successful outcome. Um, Tanya probably could speak more about it, but there are so many times that we were not even aware that a person was in crisis and that a mobile response was going and no one called 911. So it happens a lot more frequently than they thought it did. And so it's, it's better for everybody. And Tanya, it, it is better for everybody, it seems. Most of the time, yes. Most of the time, um, we, we do have a large portion of our law enforcement agents in this county who are CIT trained, crisis intervention trained. So they do have a better approach when it comes to crisis, but they're still not mental health professionals. And so when a person calls 911 because they're in a mental health crisis and police arrive, they may not be the best resource. They may be a resource, but if we can enhance the response to eliminate unnecessary ED visits and such, we want to do that. We want to keep the person comfortable where they're at. We want to serve them with the least restrictive environment to stabilize them. Emily Derenbecker, talk a little bit about what brings you here to this discussion. Sure, I'm here as a suicide loss survivor. I lost my brother to suicide in 2014 when he was 17. And at that time, I didn't know the resources that were available. I was asked what I would have done differently if I could, and I, I didn't know how to do anything differently. So since losing him, I've done what I can to really learn about all of the panelists here, about all of the resources that could be provided that can save lives, and trying to reduce stigma surrounding suicide and mental health. There's such an idea of what suicide looks like, especially in teenagers, and none of that matched who my brother was. So it's really important that I use his loss, our loss, to really do some good and to keep learning and advocating. And in that, first of all, I'm sorry for your loss. In, in, in that time, we're talking about it a lot more, and, and you played a, an active role in that. Have you noticed that in the community? In the community, I've found that if you're out at an event that is promoting mental health or suicide awareness, people just walk up and start talking. Um, everyone is kind of, I've realized, carrying these stories and these heavy thoughts around, and just knowing they have a safe place or a safe person to speak with, I think really does change a lot of what everyone is going through. And then finding ways to connect with other people that may not have been through a loss, may not have known someone that has died by suicide, but have an idea of what it looks like and just changing what that thought looks like or what their ideas of suicide look like. Emily, thank you. Um, let's throw some questions out to the whole panel. What are the challenges that you see um, that folks face in trying to navigate access to all these services that we have? I, th I think a big, uh, it, it, a lot of it's just not knowing what's out there. So like parents um, really want to support their kids, like at least from the zero to 21 perspective. Um, I would probably say for the adult perspective too, it's, it's people not knowing what's out there. Um, uh, people just needing some support and guidance. Um, I think with the onset of 988, that'll reduce some of the uh, disconnection. I think that, it, that it's a easier phone number to remember. Um, and I think in our community, we have some really great resources, like contact is a fantastic resource for folks in crisis. Um, so we're very lucky to have that here. Um, so the more ease of use, and then again, the talking about it, like um, Emily stated around, you know, having these conversations from when kids are little to talk about it. You know, uh, there's a lot of fear that if you talk about it, that's gonna make things worse. And I think, you know, shining light on things that you don't talk about really does make it better. So f for me, that's a big piece. Um, and at Access, we really try to uh, establish relationships with the families we work with. We have our Access line, which is the 463-1100 number, which families can call if they just need to figure out how to get connected to something. We do uh, a lot of guiding and hand-holding through that process. We never want a family or youth to be um, trying to figure it out on their own. We want to make sure they're connected. Um, 
So again, removing any of those barriers is really important. Um, so for, for me, that's what I see is like when families and youth are like, oh, okay, I, I, you can help me figure this out. I didn't do this because it was too difficult. I didn't understand this. I don't understand this world. That is a huge barrier that we're working constantly to eliminate. And Martin talked just a little bit about this, but in talking to somebody, you don't really plant the seed for harm, do you? I mean, that's, research has shown time and time and time again that, that doesn't happen. I think you're not planting a seed, but you're opening a door. Yep. And uh, mental health is, um, although you may have episodic um, periods where you're in crisis, uh, working on mental health is a lifelong journey. And uh, I think some of the barriers may be um, experiences where, well, that didn't help. You know, I saw this counselor, I saw this therapist, and um, you know, my life situation didn't change. So we're not changing uh, life situations necessarily. We're changing how we respond to them and how we understand them. And um, hopefully through, uh, you know, a long-term treatment, um, you're able to, uh, with that understanding and, under and um, knowledge of our uh, triggers and um, things that influence us and that we take deeply and person personally, we're able to anticipate some of those things. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a lifelong journey for everyone. So when you talk about it, it's opening a door saying, hey, we're all human. And that's actually one of law enforcement's concerns. If I ask somebody if they're suicidal, what if they then, oh yeah, maybe I am. So in CIT training, we teach them to be very direct. You're not planting that seed. Don't ask somebody if they wanna hurt themselves. Ask somebody if they wanna kill themselves because it's two different things. So we really kinda drill home that there's nothing you're doing that's changing that person's mindset from being in a crisis to then becoming suicidal. If they're suicidal, we're giving them that door that Don's talking about to now talk about it. And that's really just one of the ways that we're chipping away at that stigma about mental health, isn't mm -hmm. it? Talk a little bit about some of the other ways that you're seeing. I think one thing that um, we've seen helpful is we um, at Helio implemented a mental health first aid training a few years ago. Uh, we are offering now adult mental health first aid, um, youth mental health first aid, and now recently teen mental health first aid. And that training is geared towards non-clinical folks. So it would work with, um, you know, for example, the adult um, mental health first aid might work, just could be offered to general employers um, or other people, police officers, you know, other people in the community. Youth mental health first aid is geared towards individuals that may be working with youth between the ages of 12 and 18. It could be camp counselors, schools, uh, teachers, coaches, things like that. And it really helps them to identify um, some of those signs and symptoms of mental health, um, in, including risk of suicide, and helps them learn what to do with it. So I think um, having those trainings and making it more widely accepted that this is something that we all need to know about, we all need to talk about. It's not just on um, folks who do this work to really identify and support people. Um, it's on you know teachers, um, community members to be there to support people in our community in crisis. And this training really helps um, to give them that knowledge, understanding, and um, some ideas on what they can do to recognize um, those symptoms and support that person um, in front of them that may be experiencing some of those symptoms. Having those trainings and getting them accepted are kind of two different things. Are you, are you finding that workplace is, is getting to be more accommodating and accepting and that the, the public in general is? I think so. I think just as somebody who offers the training, we're getting more interest from um, just, like I said, employers in the community. Um, we have a school district that we're working with in the state to implement this um, within their school districts. We'll be training all students of a specific grade on teen mental health first aid, as well as uh, the faculty of the school in youth mental health first aid. So I do think folks are, are seeing this. We know this is a crisis in our community and people are, they really do want to help. And they're looking for ways that they, can, they themselves can do something to support the individuals that they care about. And you talk about school programs, Martin talked about even earlier than that. You, you have to treat it differently with different age groups, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Yeah, I mean, a young child's crisis is not going to look the same as an adult's crisis. Sure. They may not be able to verbalize their desire to not live anymore. They may just be acting aggressive or be demonstrating behaviors that are atypical. Um, you really do have to tailor crisis intervention depending on, not even, it's not even just age. I mean, we have to be culturally competent all the way around. 
and I got to think, uh, being a person of a certain age, that uh, that stigma still lingers among perhaps the older you get and, and the, the challenges that the aging population has. Mm -hmm. Is that? I think one of the um, uh, key benefits with mobile crisis um, and the 911 center engaging mobile crisis rather than the police um, is that people wouldn't ask for help because you're going to have uniformed officers show up at your house and or an ambulance and then your community sees that and oh you know what was Susie going on at Susie's house her son so and so must be you know that um, that really is a barrier to people reaching out however if you have somebody that uh, to people show up in street clothes or maybe a nursing uniform um, it's non-threatening and it doesn't draw the same attention you're in a regular uh, personal you know vehicle um, and uh, you're not drawing all that attention to somebody and, and people feel much more comfortable at, with talking to individuals that aren't in uniform. What's your suggestion to parents that are looking to start the conversation early with their family? One of the things we train our counselors on is just an active listening approach. So it's so important, as Tanya mentioned, what's a crisis for a youth may not be a crisis for us as an adult. I think a lot of times we hear like, oh, you, you broke up with your boyfriend, you were together for a week, that's not really a big deal. But for a 13, 14 year old, that could be a huge deal. So being able to step back as a parent or as an adult in a child's life and see the, the experience or the crisis from their perspective. Um, and we really focus on understanding the feelings that are going on behind that crisis. So we might not relate to exactly what that person is going through, but we probably have been in a situation where we have felt devastated or like our, you know, like our whole world is falling apart or um, betrayed by someone. And so if you can connect with those feelings, I think it makes, um, it opens up a conversation and it, it helps provide support for kids who may not know how to verbalize those feelings. If you can name it for them, they can say, oh yeah, that is how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and so then what can we do to help support you through this feeling? So just starting those conversations, being open-minded and being non-judgmental is really important. When's the right time to start those conversations, do you think? How early? It's never too early. Yeah, I think it's important to talk about feelings with kids regardless of how old they are. And then, you know, like Tanya said, that like age appropriate, you're going to make sure that, you know, the, the weight of the conversation is appropriate to what they can handle. So you don't, you don't give a baby a 500 pound barbell, you give them like, you know, a little weight, it's what they can handle. So, you know, and, and that opens up dialogue. So when a, when a child has dialogue with an adult, they have a trusting relationship. They can build hope with that person. Um, that's what's gonna, you know, and, and I think for adults and parents, it's about, you know, stabilizing our own worries about our kids and making sure that, you know, we're in a place that we're having this conversation and we can manage those things. So it's, it's about being mindful and thoughtful. And I think across the, the board, no matter what age, having those conversations or opening up those conversations putting yourself in a place to ask someone what's going on makes you mm -hmm. a trusting and caring adult. So whether it's for a kid, a coworker, a spouse, if you're the one who is starting those conversations, you become a safe person. They recognize something is going on. Um, they're the ones who are reaching out to me saying, hey, something seems different. You know, do you want to talk about it? Um, even if you know, it's not something they want to talk about right then, you become a safe person. And so hopefully if something is going on down the road, they feel comfortable turning to you. I think it's been a, I'm sorry. I was going to say another resource um, in our community is the schools. Um, over the past few years, um, in collaboration with the county and, and many of us providers, there's been an increase in resources within um, the school districts in the county. So if, if um, parents are concerned about their children and aren't really sure how to start some of these conversations or they have started them but uh, have identified maybe there's a need for more, um, certainly reaching out to somebody at their school, at their child's school would be helpful. Um, um, almost all the districts here in this county have, uh, I think all of them have mental health resources available um, that could support the family and the student uh, if they're not sure where to start themselves. I have had, I feel like it's been a privilege to be able to witness families dialogue. And there's two things that I um, always see. One is as a parent, and I struggle with this myself, is listening. Letting um, the 
letting the, you know, for me, uh, my child or in the dynamics of a family group, allowing the person to even just finish their sentence. Um, so just say pause, okay, go ahead. Well, we're gonna let, go ahead and finish your thought um, and not fixing it. Right, so we immediately, as soon as, oh, you know, I'm sad about, or somebody hurt me, or, um, and that starts real, real little, right? It's just allowing them to express themselves and not try to fix it unless they want you to, they, unless they ask for help. Um, that allows the trust from a very young age um, to develop and say, hey, somebody cares about me and is willing to listen to me, and isn't, I, I'm not gonna go tell them about that because all they're gonna do is say, well, you should just, right? So let them finish their sentence is a good start. Don, I hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <laughs> growing up may be the hardest job any of us ever have. It is so difficult to be a kid, especially today, and especially with social media uh, complicating everybody. And I just saw three of you take a deep breath when I said that. Um, how does social media play into this? A lot of kids say, you know, it's impossible to leave it behind. You can't cut it off. Uh, is that true? How complex is it? How, what? How does that play into all this? I think like everything else, um, social media has its pros and cons for kids. Um, we obviously see a lot of, in the media about, you know, um, cyberbullying or the, we've seen some suicide packs that are happening mm -hmm. through social media. Um, so it gets a really bad rap and, you know, kids are constantly on their phones and wrapped up in things that maybe we weren't when we were kids. On the other side, um, there are a ton of online supports for kids who someone mentioned earlier, kids don't talk on the phone anymore. They don't really talk much at all anymore. Everything they do is through technology. And so, hey, if we can offer them support groups through technology, like let's do that. They may connect with an online friend that they'll never meet in real life, but that's their safe person. That's who they feel comfortable talking to. And you know, parents are like, well, I'm not gonna give my kid a phone until they're 14. Well, in this day and age, they're doing so many extracurricular activities and with the way of the world, we want our kids to have a lifeline. We want our kids to be able to call us if they need us. Right. Anybody we else? see a lot of people, at, uh, adolescents at CPEP that reached out on social media and um, voiced their suicidal ideation. And to empathize, like, to think about being alone and with this device in hand um, and just being in your head. You have all these influences that are, uh, you know, the best photo and selfie of everybody else. And here I feel terrible. And everybody else in the world is all rainbows and sunshine. Um, not true, right? We all know that as, we, as uh, we get older, but sometimes for the adolescent, that isn't the case. And uh, when they're feeling isolated and they have that tool, they will post something that somebody else will see. And so I often wonder if there wasn't that tool there, would it have been a note that got stuck under a pillow or a mattress that nobody would have ever found? And uh, this allowed other people to see what it was that they were feeling um, and then come and get help. Miriam, you're a parent, how, how do we, uh, discuss this with our kids. I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've had a son that has had varying degrees of paying attention to anything that I said. Um, what's the best way to approach it? Oh, that's a good question. I'm not sure in terms of kid kids. Um, I've got a niece of my own who's a teenager, so we're not too far apart ourselves, so she kind of identifies with me more than she would with someone that's older. And so I think it's just about coming down to their level in a way of just having them see someone that they could identify with or just simply just be there, open up and kind of talk through. And um, I think it was Don that said, like, just letting them finish their sentences and stop like butting in all of the time. And I know it's really hard, but just you're there, you're kind of listening, you're hearing what's going on. And then from there trying to kind of talk together, what are the options, what's gonna be best for you, what are you looking for? Because sometimes we don't, we don't know what's best ourselves. And so trying to figure out together what will be the best outcome. And really finding allies, whether it's in the family, in the neighborhood, friends, cousins, aunts and uncles that are close, 
um, mm -hmm. th that can really help. Yeah. Um, there is a stereotype, there's always been stereotypes about therapy, but part of the awareness, the goal of awareness programs is to try to break that down. How can we open those doors that you talk about? Keep talking about it, mm -hmm. <laughs> doing what we're doing right now. I mean, when I approach someone about therapy and they've got their guard up, I usually frame it to them, listen, it's just a third party person who has no knowledge of your history, of the conflicts in your life. It's somebody that you can just literally dump all your stuff onto. They can listen, they can offer advice if you ask for it, but it's just a third party person to un unload onto. And I kind of frame it that way. and. You know, the, okay, that does sound kind of nice. Or, or we'll relate it. We're out in the field with somebody in crisis. Hey, you're talking to me. I'm a therapist. Mm -hmm. And they're like, wait, what? You are? <laughs> yeah, this is, this is what it's like. It's okay. And then the more we all talk about our own therapy and mm -hmm. encouraging friends, family members, employees, therapies, it's just like going to the doctor. I like to tell people it allows friends to be friends. Right? Instead of using your friend or your family member uh, to work through all your stuff, uh, you have a place now to do that and it allows your friend to just be your friend. A lot of times people can just sort of find their answers by being able to talk things out. Um, what are some of the other effective uh, coping uh, strategies that you, you might suggest? I think talking, talking with folks, trusted individuals is is really helpful um, and I think we've seen a lot of um, good evidence that talking with um, peers you know just other individuals that have maybe been through what you've been through before um, whether it's through a formal relationship with an organization or just somebody that you know um, you know somebody that's appeared to you that you've that's been through something that you've been through and gotten through it uh, I think having those conversations um, is extremely helpful because it helps you to realize that you're not alone um, and that person uh, will likely have more empathy um, if they have been through it and, and be able to share some things with you that may have helped them um, when they were dealing with it. When we work on safety plans, whether it's a suicide safety plan or just like an emotional support safety plan with our callers, um, we, we talk to them about what's worked best for them in the past. So it's really to, easy to say for me, you know, taking a bath and having a cup of tea is a great coping skill, but that's not true for everyone else. So having them think back to another time where they were struggling and what worked really well for you, who was there to support you, um, what activities helped take your mind off of it that were safe. Um, all of those things, if you can draw on past experiences, are really helpful. Um, and when we, we look at you know, people that can be supportive, activities that can be supportive, places that can be supportive. If someone is struggling and they're sitting inside their house and it, you know, all of their thoughts are kind of building up, is it helpful to go out to a coffee shop and just remove yourself from that environment for a little bit? Um, so there's, there's multiple layers. And then having you know, an, a safe person or emergency contact if none of those things are working. So whether that's um, a trusted friend, like we mentioned, a, a coach, a parent, um, a school teacher, a, a friend, a coworker, having someone who you can call, and then having a backup. So ha calling 988, we are, we're here 24 seven. So if no one else is available, reach out so that you can talk through what's going on. As much as 988 makes so much sense and it gives g greater access, it's easy to remember. Um, there are messages floating around on social media that it's a magnet for the cops. It's a, you know, you're bringing trouble on yourself if you use it. What do you say to that? How do you counter that? Yeah, I think especially um, launch week, we saw a lot of those messages floating around of, of don't call, they're going to send the police. Um, and I guess the best thing to do is to talk about what actually goes on in the call. So as I mentioned, most of our calls are de-escalated over the phone. Um, less than 1% of calls ever have any kind of police involvement. And the only time that we get someone involved, get law enforcement or police involved is if someone's done something already to harm their lives. We wanna, we wanna save lives. So if someone has indicated that they have done or are about to do something, that's a time where we would reach out to our partners at, with law enforcement. But most of the time, there's no, there's no interaction with law enforcement. If you call 911, um, calls are confidential. Like I said, we ask for a name. People don't even have to give us a name if they don't want to. Um, and we just are a safe place to talk and then make connections as needed. But very rarely are they with law enforcement. I think that people think 
law enforcement officers want to be at all of these calls, but you'd be surprised to know law enforcement is so relieved when a mental health professional can take a call. There's no criminal activity, there's no medical emergency, no fire emergency, all of that. They are so relieved to be able to go address other calls and let us handle mental health calls. We have an audience here in the studio with us and we've also got a lot of people at home uh, checking in uh, on Zoom. And I wanna open things up uh, to some audience Q&A here. Uh, and I'll start with a, a question that came in during the registration process from one of our Zoom attendees. Uh, she writes, my daughter-in-law just ended her life after three to four years of ineffectual hospital stays and medications that didn't help. I hope to learn why. Um, that's part of the stigma, I guess. Part of the, uh, how, do you, how do you address a comment like that? Well, there's layers of mental illness. There's severe and persistent mental illness. Um, it's, I don't wanna equate it to you know, a medical disease, but if we think about something, you know, there are diseases that have a scale. There's some that are, treat like let's just use cancer as an example. Some people have treatable cancer they get a couple rounds of chemo or radiation and they're in remission. Um, mental health is very similar. People can get treatment and they can be in recovery. That doesn't mean they're cured. It's not something that's cured. You're just like with cancer, you're in remission. You're getting those checks for the rest of your life. Same thing with mental health. It can ebb and flow. And there is severe persistent mental illness out there that treatment may not work for long-term. It's unfortunate. And Emily, I don't know if you found this, but I know um, I also identify as a lost survivor. And I think that's one of the really hard things about suicide is you are left wondering why a mm -hmm. lot. And, and it's hard to wrap your head around sometimes that question's not going to be answered. Um, and it, you know, it's a grieving process and it can be a lifelong grieving process. But, but we don't always know that, that why behind a suicide loss. And that can be really hard. Yeah, I... Um lost two aunts, one is an adolescent and one um, in my 20s, and both of them were incredibly beautiful, loving human beings that it made no sense at all. And the depth that that infected our family lives, our family unit, um, and ways that we will never completely understand um, is huge. And I think when talking with patients in the moment of crisis, of course, CPAP visits and hospitalizations are necessary and essential sometimes. but it's a different nurse, it's a different provider, it's a different counselor, and it's a different crisis in the moment. We're not learning any tools, we're dealing with the crisis and we're averting um, and, and addressing safety, but we're not learning anything about ourselves. We're not, um, so I always tell um, individual, individuals that are hesitant about engaging in therapy that that person is going to know you, that psychiatrist is going to learn you, that primary care provider is going to be able to recognize small little cues that um, something has changed for you. They're gonna maybe hopefully get to know your, your definitely your therapist or counselor, get to know your family unit and be able to ask you, uh, so how's that relationship with your mom going or your um, significant other and uh, kind of drive you to better understanding wh what your internal process is. Um, Cause a lot of times we lack uh, any sort of understanding on how we're reacting to things and how we're feeling about things. Cause we just do, we just stay busy and uh, we don't actually work through the stuff. And Emily, what advice do you have for people who might have a friend or a you know, colleague that's suffered loss like this? If you've gone through loss, I know for myself, it felt like you're the only person that has ever gone through it. And it doesn't feel safe to talk about suicide because there is such a stigma and you do feel alone in that. But they find that one in 10 people know someone that takes their own life and one in six are profoundly impacted for the rest of their life. So even when it feels alone, sitting up here, so many of us have something that connects us to a suicide loss. So talking about it, I think, really opens up a lot of the doors to those conversations. And in talking about it and feeling less alone, I think that's where we're all able to do good. Thank you. Um, we, if, does anybody in the audience have anything that they want to talk about? 
Let me, we did, uh, in, during registration, we got another question. Can someone please speak to gender dysphoria, why it's so prevalent among teens today, and how it relates to online sites, especially in light of COVID, when we were all clustered in and Zoom was the only answer we had. Um, did anybody talk to that? I don't believe it's a new thing. I believe that it's now being talked about. Yeah. And there are forums uh, to um, be able to learn more about and get words and language to something that um, people had no words to explain. They just knew they were different. And because they were different, they looked for uh, other uh, er areas that were different that allowed them, um, that sometimes weren't safe. Um, and uh, I mean, that still happens today. Um, but the language is there. There's words to be able to use. We are nothing without language. Um, so uh, I think that it isn't new. And, and I would say that I think that um, part of the progress we're making is around talking about these things. So rather than, like they're being talked about, I would agree completely that, that we're not, these aren't new, it's just, there's, there's not as much stigma, so we're, we're actually having some success there, and that's why we're hearing about it more. And I think that's, you know, we need to continue to support um, teens who are experiencing that, um, because it, that's really important. It's really important to not put shame or stigma around something somebody is struggling with. Um, and, the, and the more we can do that, the more hope we can build for that person, and um, we'll have, they'll have a better future and better outcomes. All right, one other comment. Uh, what could be offered as suggestions to parents and our caregivers who struggle with suicidal thoughts of their children due to varying reasons such as cultural bring, upbringing, personal doubts, their own fears? Any thoughts about that? Again, I guess it's, you know, what do you say to parents who don't know what to... Emily, you, you nodded. I think so many parents are afraid to talk about it with their kids and pretending suicide doesn't happen isn't going to benefit them. Pretending it's not out there isn't getting rid of the problem. So by not talking about it, I think that raises some shame, at least in the children's mind, about who dies by suicide and relating it to being a shameful act. So if they are going through it, they don't feel they can talk to those people in their lives. So I think, like we've said so many times, just continuing conversation, being open about people we've lost or about our own mental health when we're talking to kids is really important. It goes back to the question you asked earlier about um, when you're talking about suicide, are you planting a seed? And I think a lot of parents are fearful if they have those conversations with their kids, their young, impressionable kids, that now the kids are going to start thinking about it. There's no too soon to start labeling emotions and encouraging mm -hmm. discussions about feelings and how stressors are affecting us. It's never, I mean, as soon as a kid has verbal ability, those conversations, even before they, they have verbal, you know, they understand before they can speak. Labeling emotions, having those open discussions, not worrying about if I say suicide, now my kid might start thinking about suicide. I think another important thing to keep in mind, though, is that sometimes as a parent or as a caregiver in general, we might just not be in a place to, to take that on. So it's really important to hear those messages that kids or people in our lives are telling us um, and take them seriously and let them know that we're so happy that they shared that with us. Like we're, we're glad that they see us as a trusted person. But right now, maybe isn't a time where I can take that on myself. And so who else can we connect with to make sure that you get the support that you need, even if it's not from me, um, and then doing regular check-ins. So, you know, a parent could be struggling with their own thoughts of suicide, and, and they might not be able to support their child in a way that, that they would like to. So if that's the case, who, who can be your support? Let's get you connected. Let's make sure that we build a safety net underneath of you, and then continuing to check in with them. Lisa, I gotta imagine it's never too early to uh, start educating yourself too, you, even if you don't think about it with your, your children or your family or, or whatever. 
Yeah, no, exactly. There's a lot of resources out there just as a professional and a parent myself. You know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of national um, organizations that you can get a lot of information on about how to speak to your children, um, how to address it. And, it, you know, I think a lot of the things that, that our um, group has talked about here today with active listening and um, I think Dawn, you know, really what she touched on is just kind of listening, um, hearing, hearing the kids out, letting them finish their sentences. Um, those are those are really important pieces, um, but there's a lot of resources out there um, you know I think that we're we're working towards reducing stigma we're talking about it a lot more um, you know I think I see I see it in the media more um, about mental illness and and um, you know being able to seek services and there's been some um, large national figures that have talked about their own mental health struggles so I, I think um, you know we're doing a lot in terms of stigma and there's just a lot of resources out there for folks and certainly take advantage of those um, and, and reach out. We are working hard in this community to have a no wrong door approach as mm -hmm. a few others have talked about so um, there's you can hopefully reach out to to anybody locally and we'll get you um, get you what you need for support uh, whether it's you know immediate crisis support or just some resources to help you through whatever you and your family are going through. With a panel like this, I've got to take advantage of this. How about advice on creating good mental health for yourself and taking care of yourself? Uh, any, any, any quick answers for a <laughs> lifelong challenge? You can't pour from an empty cup. <laughs> you can't. You have to take care of yourself. If you want to take care of other people, you have to take care of yourself first. Find what brings you joy. Find what brings you relaxation. Find the coping skills that work for you. And then you can help others, too. Anybody add to that? Being kinder to ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that um, something I, I say to patients is if you were this, if you were your friend, right, or you were your parent, uh, what would you say? Or if it was a stranger and they expressed to you what you just said about yourself, what would you say to them? Would you be really kind to them or would you shun them? And they always, you know, everybody has some kindness in them and we, we, we should be able to give that to ourselves. A lot of talk these days of self-care and people have always been afraid of, uh, well, I can't do that. Oh, how do you get over that hurdle, taking care of yourself? I think it's a challenge. I think one thing that um, we have to learn is just to be able to say no to things um, that don't make us happy, that don't serve um, a good purpose um, in our lives, and making sure that we're comfortable and um, unapolog unapologetically saying, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't do that, or, or you know, I can't do that today. Um, and to give ourselves time to take care of ourselves and do what we need to do for ourselves and our families so that, um, and I think Tanya said it perfect, you can't pour from an empty cup. So you have to mm -hmm. um, take care of yourself so you can care for others. And I think it's really easy to feel like that can go to the bottom of the to-do list, right? Like I have all of these other things that I need to get done. And so I'm going to pr prioritize all of those over myself. Um, but I think it's really helpful to look at it as an important part of your schedule and an important part of um, being able to show up for those other things. Because if we're burnt out, if we're not taking care of ourselves, if we're not making time on a regular basis to do something that brings us joy when we're interacting with other people um, in a professional or personal setting, like that's gonna come out. And so to be the best that we can be, we need to prioritize ourselves sometimes. And, and we model that for the kids too. If they don't see us taking care of ourselves, why do they have to take care of themselves? So I think there's a big piece of that. We also model that for peers, you know, I think uh, Tanya mentioned it, but like just talking about like who's, if you're in therapy, talking about that, just normalizing the conversation for both kids and then for other peers as well. You know, I, I think it's so, kids, kids learn from what they see. And if they see you taking care of yourself and you working on your mental health and again, age appropriate, um, they're gonna they're gonna take that opportunity to think about how they gotta take care of themselves. So, panel, I would like to thank you all for your time this morning. It's a fantastic discussion. Our time together is coming to a close. I'd like to thank the panel for that discussion and introduce Antara Mitra, the executive director of Contact Community Services, to share share some closing remarks with us tonight. Thank you, Tim. Uh, as Executive Director of Contact Community Services, it is my honor to represent Contact and close out the discussion today. At Contact Community Services, our mission is to help individuals and organizations create positive personal and social change 
to improve the quality of lives in central New York. For over 50 years, we have been partnering with other agencies and organizations to make our mission a reality. I think the discussion we heard today and the system of care that it showcases is a good example of this. There is no magic bullet to improve mental health and suicide prevention. It takes the entire community working synergistically with a long-term focus to bring about real change. Here in Onondaga County and in central New York, we have been fortunate to have strong leadership, both at the county and city, as well as within the nonprofit sector, as Contact continues to expand our 988 services in the region. We hope this collaboration and support gets stronger. I would like to thank our participants, audience members, sponsors, and staff who have worked so hard to put this event together. A big thank you to our hosts at WCNY and our panel discussion moderator, Tim Fox. I also want to recognize Cheryl Jui Russo Director of Crisis Services at Contact, who many of you know. She has worked tirelessly to make this event a success, but unfortunately could not be here today. As we close out Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, I hope this discussion gave you all some new information, ideas, and hope to keep striving to help those around us who are struggling. Thank you. And Sarah, thank you very much. We wanna thank you all for joining us today. And we hope that this conversation is just the start of hope help and healing for someone in your life. Thanks for being with us. Thank you for joining us for the Let's Talk About It Hope, Help and Healing panel discussion.